There's a phrase biologists often use that doesn't sound romantic, but explains more about love in the wild than any poem. Reproductive investment. If a dangerous courtship pays better than a safe one, the dangerous courtship wins. It gets repeated, perfected, and etched into bodies and instincts until it's no longer a gamble, but tradition, a pattern carried forward by those who survived it. Across millions of years, that pattern has given rise to love stories so fierce they blur the line between devotion and destruction. One place where that tradition is almost painfully clear is the fossil record. It doesn't only show who lived and who died. Sometimes it captures the exact moment where mating and mortality crossed paths. On the floor of an ancient volcanic lake in what is now Germany, fine layers of mud built a natural archive that saved details as delicate as fur, feather barbs, and even stomach contents. That place, called Messel Pit Fossil Site, also saved something more intimate. Several pairs of an Eocene turtle, Alaiochelis crassisculpta, are preserved in classic mating posture, the smaller male positioned above the female, tails aligned, cloacal openings touching. The lake's waters were layered, with a stable, oxygen-rich zone near the surface and a deeper layer saturated with volcanic gases, an invisible trap for anything that ventured too far down. A couple that began mating near the surface could drift while locked together, sink a little too far, and cross an invisible threshold their bodies couldn't handle. The snapshot is both tender and clinical. Courtship, exactly as designed, delivered two animals into a lethal layer. The behavior that usually secures the future did its job so faithfully that it ignored the one risk that mattered that day. A continent and 180 million years away, another moment of reproductive risk hardened into stone. Early ichthyosaurs, marine reptiles that evolved torpedo-shaped bodies and tail fins, did not lay eggs on land. They gave birth in the water. A spectacular fossil of Cowhusaurus from China shows a mother with one baby already out and a second lodged mid-delivery, head first. In the sea, a tail-first birth keeps the head inside longer and reduces the time a newborn spends underwater before its first breath. Early in the transition from land to water, some lineages still delivered head first, a holdover from their ancestors. Here, the timing or position failed. The mother, the stuck baby, and a third still inside all died in place. It's a quiet picture of how evolution pays for new solutions, with real bodies, at real moments, when a change in lifestyle hasn't yet been matched by a matching change in mechanics. Parental care tells the same story from a different angle. In the Cretaceous deserts of Mongolia, a sleek, beaked theropod, an oviraptorid, crouched over a ring of eggs and never moved again. For years, that animal was cast as a thief. Its nickname literally meant egg snatcher. Then, embryos inside similar nests turned out to be oviraptorids, not someone else's young. The posture, four limbs splayed, body low over the clutch, matches modern birds brooding a nest. A sandstorm buried the parent in the act of doing the one thing that made sense in that environment, staying on the eggs. The risk is obvious. Wind and sand can suffocate. Every minute spent unmoving can draw scavengers or predators. But in a place where temperature swings are harsh and small, scavengers are always probing. Abandoning the nest when danger loomed probably meant losing the entire clutch. The fossil shows a single failure. The behavior stayed in the oviraptorid population because most of the time it worked. In the fossil beds of Montana, the Hadrosaur Myasaura, the good mother lizard, left rings of eggs, shattered shells, and small bones from young that grew fast after hatching. The pattern repeats across layers, evidence that adults returned to the same nesting grounds year after year. Some animals paid for romance up front by wearing their intentions on their heads. Long before dinosaurs, in Permian floodplains, Dimetrodon carried a tall sail built on elongated spine bones. That structure probably did more than regulate heat. It was a billboard. To grow and maintain a large, blood-fed sail is expensive and risky. A big, showy sail might look impressive, but it's also fragile. The spines can break, the skin can rip, and it makes you easier for predators to spot. That's exactly why it works. Only the healthiest, strongest individuals can afford to carry something so risky and still survive. If potential mates are judging you based on the size or quality of your sale, then the danger is part of the test. Over many generations, the individuals who could handle the risk were the ones who attracted more partners, so the risky display stuck around. A similar push and pull likely shaped the enormous frills and horns of later ceratopsian dinosaurs. Defense surely mattered when tyrannosaurs lived in the same valleys. But the variety of frill shapes, the way certain knobs and spikes grow as animals approach adulthood, and the sheer cost of hauling all that bone suggest social display and mate choice were major drivers. 
a giant frill blocks vision and adds weight. It makes sudden turns harder and long runs more expensive. If those handicaps stayed in the lineage anyway, it's because they were matched or exceeded by the reproductive rewards of being chosen. Display adds danger in ways sound can carry, too. Duck-billed hadrosaurs like Parasaurolophus had long, hollow crests connected to their nasal passages. Model these crests and you get deep, carrying notes that would roll across floodplains and forests. A call like that isn't just an announcement to mates and rivals, it's a beacon for anything that hunts by ear. If Paris Herolophus was the warm-up, here's where the show gets messy. We tend to picture courtship as quiet, some calls, some colors, the end, but sometimes the rock itself records the drama. In Western North America, paleontologists have found what are essentially dinosaur dance floors, patches of sandstone gouged and scraped in a way that doesn't match nests or feeding. The size and spacing match large, bird-like theropods. Imagine turkey tracks scaled to the size of a refrigerator. The scrapes are clustered, like the display arenas some modern birds make, where males compete side by side for female attention. These fossils are literally the footprints of prehistoric courtship rituals. And then, sometimes, the fossil doesn't just show the pregame, it catches the act. A piece of Baltic amber from around 45 million years ago preserves a termite king and queen in their first date. In living termites, when a male and female pair up, the female walks ahead and the male follows closely, touching her with his antenna as they search for a place to start a new colony. The fossil pair is frozen mid-stride in exactly that posture. Researchers even compared the fossil to modern termites walking on sticky surfaces to confirm it wasn't random. It's a moment of behavior from deep time, two insects caught right at the start of their empire. Amber has a way of catching the most fleeting moments. Another fossil from Baltic amber captures a male and female moth in copula, mid-mating. Moths are already rare in this amber. Finding a locked pair is exceptional. And yet, here they are. Wings spread, bodies joined, giving us direct evidence of posture, positioning, and how mating worked for their kind. Sometimes amber even preserves the private details. A 99-million-year-old harvestman, a relative of today's daddy longlegs, was trapped with his penis fully extended. In modern harvestmen, genital shape is a major clue to species identity. This fossil preserves it in such detail that scientists could see the glands, stylus, and shaft. Its biology, behavior, and anatomy all locked in place for nearly 100 million years. There's also the assassin bug from Baltic Amber, preserved with male genitalia so clear you can see each hinge and joint. Assassin bugs are infamous for aggressive, sometimes damaging mating strategies, so seeing the exact equipment they used is more than a curiosity. It's a window into the arms race of reproduction. If the insects and arachnids bring the humor, other fossils tell stories closer to tragedy. Ancient sea scorpions, or eurypterids, likely gathered in large numbers in shallow waters to molt, mate, and interact, much like modern horseshoe crabs do today. That's efficient for reproduction, but it's also efficient for predators. Some fossil sites contain heaps of shed skins and carcasses alongside fossilized feces packed with eurypterid fragments. In at least one species, these droppings suggest cannibalism. On land, large amphibians called temnospondyls may have faced similar dangers. Late Triassic bone beds in places like New Mexico and Poland contain thousands of their skeletons, juveniles and adults together. The most likely scenario is that these animals congregated in shrinking seasonal ponds, either to breed or survive dry periods. As the water disappeared, so did their chances. Instead of a few individuals, entire groups died together, leaving behind mass death layers that record not just an event, but a seasonal cycle of risk. Some fossils preserve mating strategies so unusual they almost feel like slapstick. In a small armored fish from the Devonian called Microbrachius, males had L-shaped claspers for transferring sperm, and females had matching plates to receive them. The only way the anatomy works is if the fish swam side by side, like two shopping carts trying to connect at the corner. It's an odd image, but this may be the first known vertebrate to reproduce through copulation, rather than external fertilization. This awkward side-by-side -side shuffle is a milestone in reproductive history. 
Another armored fish, Matterpicius attenboroughi from Australia, takes the story further. One fossil preserves a developing embryo still attached to a mineralized umbilical cord inside the mother. That's evidence of live birth 380 million years ago, long before mammals evolved. It shows that some animals invested heavily in fewer, well-developed young, instead of releasing hundreds of eggs. Both strategies, quantity versus quality, still exist today. If we zoom in to the smallest scale, we find fossil reproductive extremes that seem almost wasteful. Tiny crustaceans called ostracods were found in Cretaceous amber from Myanmar, and one female still carried giant sperm cells inside her. These sperm were enormous compared to her body, an energy-intensive strategy that evolved to ensure successful fertilization. And it's not new, this same approach was already in place 100 million years ago. Even flying reptiles have given us reproductive clues. A Jurassic pterosaur nicknamed Mrs. T was found with an egg and lacked the large head crest seen in other individuals. That egg association helped confirm that the crest was a male feature for display, likely used to attract mates. As in many species today, what impresses potential partners can also make you stand out to predators. At this point, we've been living in the fossil record, but these patterns don't just belong to the past. What happened millions of years ago isn't just a strange prehistoric story. The same push and pull, attraction, competition, risk, still shapes mating in the animals alive today. Horseshoe crabs, for example, still gather by the thousands on certain beaches each spring. Females haul themselves ashore to lay masses of eggs, often with several males clinging on. The sheer density of bodies is an open invitation for predators, just as it would have been for ancient sea scorpions. Among whales, mating can be a slow-motion collision. Males jostle alongside a female, each trying to stay closest, while others attempt to shove rivals away. These mating scrums can last for hours, and while they're rarely lethal, they carry risks. Even insects keep proving the point. Bedbugs mate through traumatic insemination. Males stab the female's body wall and inject sperm directly into her body cavity. Females have evolved a special organ to reduce the damage. This evolutionary arms race mirrors the strange, sometimes dangerous genital adaptations we see preserved in amber. And then there are the small, almost sweet moments. After a summer rain, you might see a pair of termites performing their tandem run across a sidewalk, the female leading, the male following closely. You've already seen this behavior frozen in amber from 45 million years ago. It hasn't changed. Whether in a prehistoric swamp or a modern ocean, mating is never just about attraction, it's about navigating the costs. Display arenas, bright crests, giant sperm, or elaborate dances might win a mate, but they also make you easier to spot. Gathering in one place might increase your chances to breed, but it also increases your chances of ending up as someone else's dinner. The details change across hundreds of millions of years, but the trade-off doesn't. Risk a lot. Now so your genes get a chance to roll the dice again. 